Uh, good morning. My name is Anjali Gopakumar. I worked in my thesis on the topic mercury accumulation in fishes from northeast and northwest Barents Sea during the polar night. Uh, I worked at the University of Oslo with my supervisors, Dr. Katrin Borcha and Yulia Gibkenstein. Now, mercury is a heavy metal that's found worldwide. It was previously used in scientific instruments like thermometers, in lights, in medicine, and a lot more. Although its use has now reduced, it's been found naturally in the environment in volcanic eruptions, forest fires, and ores like cinnabar. However, humans have altered the natural biogeochemical cycling of mercury with their many anthropogenic activities, some of which include the use of power plants, mining, and waste incineration plants. Further, mercury is now recognized as a chemical of global concern, especially because of its long-range transport, high persistence, and potential toxicity. Mercury is transported to the marine ecosystems via atmospheric riverine and oceanic transport and in the environment of particular concern is methyl mercury which is transformed from the several other inorganic forms of mercury methyl mercury is integrated into primary producers and passed on to further trophic levels via diet now mercury concentration is found to increase in individuals over time by a process known as bioaccumulation mercury is also found to increase across successive trophic levels by a process known as biomagnification so much so that predators, especially organisms at the top trophic levels, have been found to have mercury levels way higher than that found in the surface waters. This has led to these organisms having neurotoxic, behavioral, hormonal, and reproductive effects. In general, though, mercury concentrations in biota are influenced by physicochemical characteristics like pH and dissolved organic carbon, and food web processes like trophic uh, relationships and species diversity. In our study, we focused on food webs with a specific focus on fishes. Now, the relevant way to characterize food webs is by performing stable isotope analysis. This is a tool that helps to reflect the diet of an organism over time. In our study, we characterized delta 13C and delta 15N, which are stable isotopes of carbon and nitrogen respectively. Now, the heavier isotopes of carbon and nitrogen are retained to a larger extent than the lighter isotopes, and this difference is depicted by the symbol delta. So, delta 13C reflects the relative dietary source and habitat use of an organism, and delta 15N reflects the relative trophic position. This is depicted by the figure on the right. An increase in delta 13C on the x axis shows organisms moving from pelagic feeding to benthic feeding, with pelagic referring to organisms present in the water column and benthic referring to organisms present at the bottom of the ocean. An increase in delta 15N on the y-axis shows organisms moving from the lower to the higher tropic levels. Further, Lavoie et al. 2013 also found out that mercury biomagnification or tropic transfer of mercury is the highest in colder latitudes, thus bringing us to the Arctic. Now, the Arctic is the polar region north of the Arctic Circle, which is in, in turn demarcated by the dashed line. Our study was focused on the Barents Sea, which is uh, located off the coast of Norway and Russia. Now, the Arctic is characterized by lower annual productivity, reduced species diversity, longer lived animals, and simple predator prey relationships in relatively long food chains. It's also characterized by high seasonality in light intensity, primary production, and more. This extreme variation in seasonality is especially evident during the polar night. In the Arctic, the polar night is a period between November and January during which the entire Arctic Circle is completely enveloped in darkness. This is a relatively understudied period during the year and is also the period during which our study was undertaken. There are many reasons why it's important to look at mercury contamination worldwide, but a few extra reasons why it's important to look at it in the Arctic. The first being the distinctive ecosystem characteristics. The colder temperatures in the Arctic lead to slower growth rates and to slower mercury excretion rates both of which lead to higher mercury accumulation in individuals. In addition, the simpler food webs and low species diversity leads to higher biomagnification of mercury in Arctic food webs as compared to those found in the lower latitudes. Another reason is the fact that Arctic indigenous folk like Inuits and Yupik have always relied on fishing for their nutritional, cultural and social well-being and are thus the highest dietary exposure groups for mercury. Hence, these are a few reasons why it's important to look at mercury in the Arctic. Our objectives were threefold. The first was to quantify and compare mercury concentrations within fish species in each location and look at the variations as a function of several biological and ecological factors. The second was to compare mercury concentrations between fish that were sampled from Northwest and Northeast Barents Sea. 
Now, regional differences were expected in the Barents Sea owing to differences in um, water mass characteristics, proximity to industrialized areas, etc. And this was verified using our second objective. Our third objective was to examine mercury concentrations in fishes in relation to thresholds for human consumption and fish health. Our study area, as mentioned before, was the Barents Sea. Fish were sampled from the northeast and northwest Barents Sea using a pelagic and demersal trawl. Now, it needs to be noted that fish were sampled quite randomly from the Northeast Barents Sea, while they were sampled with a fixed size class in mind from the Northwest Barents Sea. We sampled three species for our study, the subarctic and pelagic capelin, the native arctic and sympagic pelagic polar cod, and the subarctic and benthopelagic Atlantic cod. The methodology followed was as such. We started with the preparation of muscle tissue. This included separating it from the rest of the matrices, freeze drying it and homogenizing it. This was followed by chemical analysis, which included mercury and stable isotope analysis. Now, total mercury can be used as adequate surrogates for methyl mercury in fish communities. Now, this is because approximately 80 to 99 percent of total mercury found in fish is made up of methyl mercury. Hence, in our study, total mercury was analyzed using a DMA-80, a direct mercury analysis. Now, coming to our results in discussion, we analyzed nine biological and ecological factors in our study. Um, we started with biometrics, which included weight, length, body condition, which was calculated by Fulton's condition factor using weight and length, followed by age and sex. We also had dietary descriptors Delta 13C and Delta 15N. This was followed by fish species and location. Now, when looking at a correlation matrix between all the factors in our study, we found a very high correlation between weight and length and length and trophic position. Now, since weight and length were already used to calculate body condition, and since trophic position was an important factor, we decided to exclude weight and length from our statistical study. We also excluded age and sex owing to the lack of a complete data set. Our final factors were then uh, used to run generalized linear models depending on our specific objectives. On running the model to look at variations in the barren sea in general, we found that fish species, body condition, trophic position, and dietary source explain mercury variations the most. We also looked at the patterns of these factors, starting with trophic position and dietary carbon source. Now, the plot on the left shows us relative carbon source on the x-axis and relative trophic position on the y-axis. And this plot in general shows us the dietary niches of each of the species in our study. On analyzing it, we found that each species from each location had a specific dietary niche with very little spatial overlap. For example, Capelin, Polar Cod, and Atlantic Cod from the Northwest seem to be feeding on distinct carbon sources, while they seem to be at a similar trophic position. The results were analyzed similarly for the rest of the species as well. We also looked at variations in fish length. Now, even though fish length was not used in our statistical study, we decided to look at its variations as a side note because, as mentioned before, since sampling was done quite variably uh, from the two locations in the balance sea, it was important to take into account any confounding effect that fish length might have had on our results. Our shows us fish length of each of the species from both locations. And on analyzing it, we found that there were differences in lengths observed between all the species from both the locations. And this is important. We looked at the general mercury patterns with respect to the factors. So this slide shows us mercury concentration on the y-axis and the most relevant biological and ecological factor on the x-axis, starting with trophic position. So mercury concentration was found to increase with increasing delta 15N. That is, it was found to increase with increasing trophic levels. Mercury concentration was found to increase with increasing delta 13C. That is, it was found to increase with increased benthic feeding. Mercury concentration was found to decrease with increasing body condition. Now, all these results corresponded to what we found in the literature. The most important factors were found to be Delta 15N and Delta 13C, thus leading us to conclude that there's a marked influence of trophic position and habitat use in the variations in mercury in the Barents Sea. To our objectives, where the first one was to compare the mercury levels between the species, in the Northwest Barren Sea, there were no differences in mercury concentrations found between the three species. This was, however, against our hypothesis where we expected Atlantic cod to have higher levels. Now, it's important to acknowledge the fact that our ability to interpret mercury data from Atlantic cod was weakened given its low sample size. 
and this could be a possible reason explaining what we've observed here. In the northeast Barren Sea, Atlantic cod was found to have higher mercury concentrations than polar cod. This was in accordance to our hypothesis, and the reasons are as follows. Atlantic cod was found to be larger and at a higher trophic position than polar cod. This led it to bioaccumulate and biomagnify more mercury than polar cod. Another reason for Atlantic cod having higher mercury uh, levels is probably its benthopelagic feeding as opposed to pol polar cod's pelagic feeding. Coming to our second objective, where we compared mercury, mercury levels between the two locations, we found that Atlantic cod from the northeast had higher mercury concentrations than Atlantic cod from the northwest. This was in accordance to our hypothesis. However, this species was not used for spatial comparison, as I'll explain. On looking at the variations in length, trophic position, and tight resource, we found that Atlantic cod from the northeast was larger and seemed to be feeding on benthic sources of carbon, while Atlantic cod from the northwest was smaller and seemed to be feeding on pelagic carbon. This, along with literature review, showed us that what we were observing was an ontogenetic dietary shift. Now, an ontogenetic dietary shift is the change in the diet of fish species with changes in their size, age, etc. Hence, we believe that the reasons for variation in mercury found between Atlantic cod from the two locations was because of ontogenetic dietary shift rather than regional differences per se. Coming to polar cod, polar cod from the northeast was found to have higher mercury concentrations than polar cod from the northwest, similar to what we had observed for Atlantic cod. And this was again in accordance to our hypothesis. The reasons are as follows. Polar cod from the northeast was found to have larger delta 15 N values, thus showing that us that it was probably feeding at a higher trophic position and thus biomagnifying more mercury. Polar cod from the northeast was also found to be larger, thus showing us that it might have been older and bioaccumulating more mercury. And the last reason was found to be location. So it's possible that variations in local influences, which could include variations in pH, dissolved organic carbon, uh, oceanic processes, or local sources of mercury could be the reason for variations found here. Coming to our third objective, we looked at the mercury concentrations in relation to thresholds of human consumption and fish health. Now, from literature, we found that 0.5 microgram per gram wet weight was the minimum mercury toxicity threshold in fishes and simultaneously the accepted threshold for human consumption in the EU. Now, all our individuals were way below this level. This was in accordance to our hypothesis. And this led us to conclude that none of the species in our study are currently at risk of total mercury-mediated health effects. So, to conclude, we found that trophic position and relative carbon source are the most important determinants of mercury accumulation in fish. Mercury was found to significantly increase along delta 15N, that is, along trophic levels, and from pelagic to benthic fishes. We also found interspecific variation with uh, Atlantic cod having higher mercury concentrations in the Northeast. This, along with the positive association found between delta 15N and mercury, reflected possible biomagnification in this food chain. We also found spatial variation with individuals from the Northeast having higher mercury levels than individuals from the Northwest. Now, this was linked to larger delta 15N values, larger size leading to bioaccumulation, and to variations in local influences. And now that I've come to the end of my presentation, I would like to take this opportunity to thank my supervisors at UIO, uh, the Borja Ecotox Research Group, Nansen Legacy, and the IMBRC Master Program for everything that they've done, and to you, the audience, for listening. Thank you.